It is a joy to be able to share some of the material in the book I'm writing with an audience. I've been writing this book for two years. It's been a lot of fun, but it is essentially a solitary experience to write a book. I think I met most of you. Uh, just call me Stu, and I'm going to get to some combinations here in a second. But if you have any questions, you can raise your hand, or if you're comfortable, you can just call out Stu. I don't mind. Come on in. I don't mind being interrupted. Uh, <clears throat> probably I should introduce myself. Uh, I'm Stuart Rachels. Uh, I haven't played chess in 20 years, but I think the pieces still move the same way. And I, I played from the ages of 9 to 23, or from 1979 to 1993. And I'm writing a book. I'll tell you about that in due course, but I promise you some combinations. So let's do that. All these will be from, from my games. Now, uh, I, I don't actually think that there's a logical place to begin here. I think chess is sort of like the ocean. You just dive in somewhere and you start swimming. So uh, why don't we start here with this position. Uh, this is a game, uh, actually in my book, even though I'm talking about combinations, this is not in one of the tactics chapters. This is just a rook and minor piece ending uh, game. There's a, probably more tactics in end games than people, people realize. So I was playing white in this game against um, a player I don't know named Aki Kanamori, who's around 2400. This is in the 1988 US Open. Now this was a last round game, right? Last round games are pretty important in terms of how you're, how you're going to feel on the way home. OK, so what's happening here? So we have a position of even material, reduced material. Uh, white is more active here, but black looks to have things covered. You probably think it might be a draw. The, the only way that white can try to make his pieces more active, these rook and bishop are, are pretty good right now. White could bring his king into c5, but that's really not going to do anything. Black can give this check with his rook. If white wants to be aggressive and play king d6, then just another check with a rook. And the king comes back. And another check of the rook. White's not doing anything here. Uh, but one, one principle of attacking is that if all your pieces are in good squares, if they're all contributing to your attack, see if you can throw a pawn into the mix. And so this is the right first move. b5. And black is actually losing by force now. One reason I'm showing this game is because uh, my opponent obliged us by playing what I would think is the main line from this position, played the most natural move. Sometimes, sometimes people see uh, danger coming, and they do something unesthetic to avoid it. But here, here uh, we'll see what happens. So b5, he plays pawn takes pawn. I think that's what most of us would want to play, what I would play. And now I play a6. Okay, now white is threatening to get quite a strong pass pawn here on b7. And then black's pawn on b5 will be weak, and black will have other problems. So it, as usual in chess, there's more than one way to lose. But black played, I think, the move most of us would play, bishop c8, just trying to hold, hold that pawn. And now we go a takes b7. Bishop takes. And now I was not interested in winning my pawn back on b5, but rather playing g6. So black wants to stop this pawn while he can. F takes g6. And now the, the point of all this is revealed, e6. So white's uh, given up all of his pawns, but one, but the one remaining will be enough. Uh, what this move does, in effect, is it wins this bishop on b7. Because black's defense of this bishop, black's double defense, is now illusory. Black cannot capture or recapture twice in this square because this pawn will queen. And black has no defense here. I'll show you what uh, Kanamori did, which is as good as any. At least he set a trap for me here. Play king c8. Now the trap is, uh, I have to take this with the right piece, with the bishop. If I take it with a rook, then I lose my last pawn. Boom! Rook takes e6. Whoops. That's a shame. So now, of course, if bishop takes a rook, white's rook here hangs. 
So I think white in this position would do something like rook takes g7. Now this, is, this could still be quite a long game. I think the fact that black has these two pawns probably doesn't matter. I imagine white can win them pretty easily without swapping rooks. And then we have the end game of rook and bishop versus rook. And the computers have completely mapped out this end game, not that any human being understands their analysis. But we can say for sure that this position is drawn, but in practice, white would have winning chances. I mean, if you were playing in a blitz game against Magnus Carlsen, and you had the, the rook, and he had the rook and bishop, you should probably just resign. But it should be drawn. OK, so king c8. Now I play bishop takes bishop check. And so here's the thing. He just he cannot play rook takes bishop, or he might as well. He could just resign, really. Rook takes rook. King takes rook. And now e7, and white makes a queen. And has no problem picking up these black pawns. So bishop takes bishop check. And so black plays king c7. And now the active position of white's king is useful for white, because now the white king can come in to the defense, and black is hosed. I, I, I'll show you the rest of the game just because it's very quick. It's very quick. Uh, Kanamori played b4, right? Hope springs eternal. Maybe I'll take it and lose something. But I just play back here. That's nice. He goes king d8. It doesn't matter. Check, only legal move. Check, only sensible move. Uh, king d6, and now black resign because the white pawn will come through to the queen square controlled by white's bishop. Position number one. All right, let's move over here. All right, again, I had white in this game. Uh, I was 13 years old at the time of this game. I think Doug might remember me from, from, from those days. Uh, now, now, with the black pieces was a fellow named Jay Whitehead. This was in the World Open in 1983. And, and Jay was a 2,500. Uh, two years earlier, Jay had won the US Junior Closed. And uh, not, not a bad player. I played seven times in the U.S. Junior Closed, and I felt very lucky to win it once. The other six were, were very, very hard indeed. Okay. So Jay had really been outplaying me on the black side of a C3 Sicilian, but his last move was careless. And so now I got my big chance here. Okay, white to move. The first move that I played here is D5 uncovering an attack on black's knight on b6. Come on in if you want, y'all. OK. Bishop takes knight is threatened. Obviously what black wants to do. Oh, yeah, also this pawn is threatened. OK, bad stuff here. Black certainly wants to play knight takes pawn, which Whitehead did play. And now I got to play this fun move, bishop h6. Now got a double attack. Threatening queen takes pawn on e6 check, as well as queen takes pawn jadub on g7 check. Now you might wonder, why would I play d5? I could have played bishop h6 immediately to create this double attack. Why d5? Yeah, the, there was once a tournament uh, going on with uh, two world champions, Botvinnik and Tall, playing. And Botvinnik was sort of this, uh, this old stern schoolmaster type. And Tall was a swashbuckling tactician. And Botvinnik, the stern old guy, says to Tall about the, his game that's going on, Botvinnik says, says, why did you sacrifice that pawn? And Tall said, it was just in my way. Sometimes you do sacrifice a pawn because it's in your way. You make a line clearing sacrifice. You want to open a rank or a file or a diagonal. This is not one of those situations. The reason that I wanted to throw in the moves d5, knight takes d5, is because when black's knight is on d5, unlike on b6, 
the rook on d7 is unprotected. Now this knight on d5, this, is a very ni this would be a very nice square under other, under other circumstances. But with the specific tactics of this position, the knight is really unhelpful on d5. It covers f6, it covers e7. Those squares will not be important in what's to follow. But the protection of the rook will. And here's the variation that really shows black's problem with that undefended rook. Obviously, you have to look at the move. Pawn takes bishop. And now we've got queen takes pawn check. So black's in check, and his rook is hanging on this square. So black will try to counterattack against white's rook on h5. Now, I don't know what this position would come out with if without these moves d5, knight takes d5. But in this position, white just cleans up because white doesn't have to lose his rook. First, he comes back with check. Now black can do whatever he wants here. And now this rook is taken with check. And then white can take the knight next move and be a whole rook up. So this was really the variation that made me want to play my pawn to d5. I'll show you what black's best move is here. What black's best move is to meet this double threat. Uh, I didn't see this move. Uh, Whitehead did not see this move. Uh, a computer saw this move. It's a retreat. Retreats are difficult to see. Much easier to see aggressive moves in chess. And the retreat is king g8. So the king moves back, opening up the defense along the seventh rank for the rook on d7. And OK, white will go ahead with this move, check. And black will hunker in with his rook on f7. The rook on c8 is protected by the queen on c2. And the game will continue like this. Queen takes d5. Black will take this bishop. And then white will take this pawn because it's a free pawn. If it's free, it's for me. Now we've reached a position of equal material. But black's king is very exposed here. And black has no quick way or slow way of swapping any pieces. So th this is probably on the border of something that's winning for white or not winning for white. But in practice, black is in big trouble. It's very hard to defend with your king. It's going to be wide open for the foreseeable future with all these pieces on the board. Nevertheless, that's what uh, Jay should have tried. I'm sure he would have if he'd seen it. Not only is this a difficult move to see king g8, because it's a retreat, it's also difficult just because black is very likely to be sort of shell-shocked in this position. Things have been going very well, and suddenly I got these aggressive moves flying at him, and so he tried to move g5. White has two forced wins here. Let me show you first the move I did not play. I did not, well, here's, here's the line, win number one. Queen takes e6 check. So white's, again, just trying to win this rook on d7. And again, black should counterattack on white's rook. OK, next move. Rook takes g5 check, exploiting the pin along the sixth rank here. Black's pawn being pinned by white's queen. Black plays king takes bishop. And now this quiet move, rook g3. What's the threat here, folks? The threat, <laughs> checkmate in one move, yeah. queen h3, and black's got nothing. Black just, black can do almost nothing here. Uh, okay, knight f4, we can just look at this for a moment here, preventing the queen check. Now queen takes f6, and it's going to be mate very soon here. If black plays knight to g6, rook h3 is checkmate. I've heard that's good to checkmate your opponent. And if the black king cheats to h7, now the white queen comes to h4. And we've got the same mating pattern with the heavy pieces along the g and h file. Black's king is trapped. OK. So that, that would have been good. So I'm, I'm writing this book. I, I do want to say one thing about this variation I just showed, which is not a, a very hard variation. 
Uh, I did come up with it myself. It's, it's, it's a matter of, uh, of old school pride that the way I've been writing my book, 500 page book, I've been doing all the analysis myself and then uh, having done the analysis, I've got uh, a couple of friends, my, my main computer interpreter, Dave Gertler in Delaware, also my friend Mark Califatis in uh, Ohio has been very useful to me. So I do this analysis, I send it to them, they, they open up Houdini or Stockfish, I've never touched these programs myself, and then they, they show how all my analysis is completely wrong, and they send this back to me, and then I have to rewrite the book on this point. And as, as I've been trying to tell Doug, it's, uh, it, it's a longer process, but it really makes you appreciate the beauty of the computer analysis, to see what it does to your own analysis when you think you've done a good job. It's, it's, it's the great humbler, it's just like the rating system. Okay, but what I did find here, although I didn't think about this checkmating pattern we just saw, I played rook takes g5. Once I saw that move, I really didn't look for anything else. And you should probably know this mating pattern here. If pawn takes rook, queen takes pawn, and this is checkmate, folks. Checkmate ends the game. In, in, in fact, uh, problemists or composers would call this position a pure mate because the squares around black's king are each covered by one and only one white piece. So it's a very economical mating position. Not that tournament players care. If it's mate, who cares? Let every square be covered by 17 pieces. <laughs> okay. So Whitehead saw through this. What did he do? Okay, he's got, a pro he's got this attacked. This is a threat. He played rookie seven. Now, I'd been thinking here as white for three or four minutes, and uh, Whitehead surprised me by resigning in this position. So he was waiting for just me to play the move queen h5 check, and the black king is trapped here. This is, this is mate. Queen g6 is the only move. Queen takes queen. This is checkmate. And I just did not see this. Something about the geometry of this position, just rook g7 looked like, uh, just cried out to me as the next move to be played. I was looking at rook, take, rook g7. Uh, now, you're, you're probably not here just to be entertained. You probably want some advice that could be helpful to you, help you raise your rating, improve your game. And here's one piece of advice I have. If your opponent has a winning move, do not resign until he makes it. Okay? This, is, this has always been good for me. <laughs> however, however, it was okay really uh, that Jay resigned. Even if I continued to have a blind spot about this queen h5 check move, even if I'd played the move I was looking at, it's, uh, it's more than enough here. King, king e8, okay, this is very simple. Rook check, knight takes. Now queen takes e6, so now white is threatening maiden one on the knight on e7. Black will defend it. Rook c7. Now queen takes f6. This is just obliterating to black. White has an extra pawn. He has a huge attack. He has a stronger minor piece. And even if black were somehow to survive the onslaught of the next five moves, which is perhaps unlikely, White could probably just put his bishop on g5 and just throw his h-pawn down the board and black would be helpless. So okay, I probably could have taken care of this one myself, although it was nice to, nice to have the opponent resign. Did he ask you what you were going to play after the game? You know, he was so nice to me after the game because I thought I'd played such a great game and he said, well, let, let's go take a look at it. And then he like showed me that my position stunk the whole game and he just made this one bad move. And of course, the only thing that'll go in my book is the position after the bad move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, write your own damn book. <laughs> that, that game we played, Doug, you can put that in your book. Okay, oh, let's oh, see. Uh, no, <laughs> but, I, it's, but it's not published yet. I can still, I can still consider it. Okay, let me, let me see the next one I've got here. Okay, overloaded. I'll pick a piece, any piece. Okay. Uh, 
don't tell me I'm wrong, Doug, until I've got it all set up. Because I, uh, Uh, should do, I'll, 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 no, it's just E2. I need more pieces. I'm black at this next one. Don't let me talk while I'm doing this. I, I cannot do two things at once. It's absolutely impossible. Rook E8, where's my bishop for E7? It should be seven, knight on d4, pawn, pawn, black is a pawn on c4, rook on a1. How's this, Doug? Looking good. Okay. Impressed. I can't remember anything anymore. Okay, you don't. You don't have to. <laughs> All right. So, I have the black pieces here. This is a game I played in, in the most prestigious tournament I've ever played in, the Interzonal in 1990. If, if you know uh, how, the old, at least the, how the old world championship cycle worked, once you get to the Interzonal, uh, I was one of 70 people who might have played Kasparov for the world championship in this three-year cycle. No way I'm going to make the cut to 16. I was very lucky to make it to 70. So um, uh, this was a 13-round tournament in Manila that I played in and uh, I was one of the weakest players there. I got s f completely forgettable results. Six points out of 13, minus one, six and seven, one more loss than win. And uh, for this minus score, this forgettable score, I finished ahead of Smyslov, Komsky, and Portish. That's what the inner zone was like. If you can avoid last place, you'll have something to brag about. This game, uh, this was a Queen's Gambit Accepted. If uh, you play that opening, you might even be able to recognize it's a Queen's Gambit Accepted. We have even material here, and, and black is uh, equalized pretty easily in this game. Uh, white should probably uh, do something uh, kind of modest here. But instead, uh, my opponent, who was uh, a 2,400 feet A player from China named Lin Ta, he got aggressive here, and White's, White's position is just not good enough to warrant aggression. Now we can understand why he wanted to play this move. The knight cannot be taken on this square. White is angling for a fork here of Black's rooks. Maybe White wants to play his queen to g4, threaten checkmate on g7, uh, this sort of thing. But I don't know, you always just have to, you always have to look at the specific tactics, but You've got one piece that's crossing the Rubicon here, and not a lot of other white pieces to support it. So actually, black will win here, win by force, at least win a pawn. It's probably enough to win the game. I simply played bishop f8, a slightly defensive move, but I'm attacking the knight on e6, and then there's the white pawn on e4 behind it that's in trouble. So if white plays knight c7, this is not going to work anymore, this fork of the black rooks. Because I'll, I'll rescue this rook, capture a pawn in the process, attack white's queen. The white queen moves, and black's other rook is free to move. Black has won a, a pawn on e4. Uh, the same thing is true if the white knight captures his bishop. I like to capture bishops with my knights. But black doesn't recapture the knight here. Black wins a pawn. Black can first play this, uh, what is this, in-between move, uh, zwischen zug, something like that. Rook takes e4, taking a pawn, attacking the white queen. And when the white queen moves or white plays bishop e3, black will recapture the knight with a rook. Black's won a pawn. Okay. Uh, Lin Ta saw this, and this was not, he wasn't interested in playing knight takes bishop or knight c7. He was interested in trying to increase his attack with queen g4. He's really getting deeper and deeper in trouble here. But again, this was his idea. He's defending his knight. He's renewing this threat of knight c7 with a fork. But now black plays. I played queen c8, attacking the knight, and now pinning the knight. Now the knight can't move. There's nowhere, a knight on e6 cannot move in a way that protects 
a piece on G4. It takes four moves for knight to, tra to transfer from E6 to G4. It follows from the rules of chess. It's probably not worth complaining about. So the knight pinned cannot move. But again, uh, Lin Ta, he foresaw this and he had this idea that he would play this move, blow for blow, rook d6. Now, the cute idea here is, well, first of all, black cannot play bishop takes rook because checkmate at one, checkmate ends the game. Someone told me that was in the USCF rule book at some point. Yeah. Yeah, Alex Scherzer would make illegal moves against me in speed chess and say checkmate ends the game and try to claim the game. That's a, and I said, yeah, checkmate ends the game. You just lost. Okay. So the rook is immune on d6. It protects the knight on e6 and also opens up a threat against black's knight on b6. So this is all looks good. Here's the problem for white. The problem is that for all these tactics to work for white, the white queen must be on exactly the square g4. Let me explain. First, the white queen must be on the g-file. If we move the queen off the g-file, then black displays bishop takes rook, right? There's no queen g7 mate unless the queen is on the g-file. Second, the queen must be on the h3 c8 diagonal. Must be. If the queen's on the g-file but not on this diagonal here, then black just plays rook takes knight, free knight. Okay. So the queen must be on the g-file. It must be on this diagonal. That leaves one square that the queen must be on. And so it is. And therefore, black's winning move, h5. The white queen is overloaded. There's nothing white can do with this queen now that doesn't lose big material. If queen g6, Still on the G file, but not on the diagonal. Black wins a piece with rook takes knight. Or if the queen takes this pawn, which in fact uh, Mr. Lin Ta did. So queen G6 allows rook takes knight. A queen F5 move. Well, now we're not on the G file anymore. It allows the bishop takes rook. And so this move essentially ended the game. And again, I'll, I'll just show you the last few moves just because there's so few of them. Uh, White at least took a pawn here, but a full piece down. He's should give it up pretty soon. Uh, but he tried a little something here. Can't blame him. Rook takes knight. Losing more material. Rook takes rook. Now he threw in a check here. I don't know. He's just hoping I'll blunder and play my queen here and he'll uh, uh, swipe my rook, but of course I just play this move and that's all she wrote. Bishop e3, who knows? Queen c6. And white's a rook down, so, so white resigned this one. Okay. All right. Next. Need more pieces. And how am I doing, Doug? Great. Does that look good? All right. So this is uh, this is as much a story as anything else. No, no, no. This is wrong. This one's wrong. Rook, rook D1. Thank you. All right. Start over, folks. Put, roll the tape back. <laughs> okay. So, let's see, how old was I with this one? Okay, I was 16. 
All right, I played 1,011 tournament chess games. This is the only moment of any game that I played where I played a, a winning move and it was totally by accident. I had no idea that it was a good move. Let me walk, walk through you what my thought process was, how this happened. Okay, so I'm playing white. We have equal material here. This is in the US Open. Uh, black was a, a, a master. Is this John Y. Grecky? John Y. Grecky. Uh, he's a couple hundred points lower than me, I think. So I was hoping to win. I had not outplayed him at all in the game. It had been quite an even game. And we were both in time trouble now. Uh, I, as white, had two minutes left to make five moves. And Y. Grecky had five minutes left to make five moves. And this is the days before increments. Two minutes. That's all I had for the five moves. And my, my flag was rising, those old analog mechanical clocks, or as I call them, chess clocks. OK, now another fact here is that me and my opponent, we had just made several moves quickly that had changed the nature of the position. So when this position arose, I literally had not had a second to think about it until my clock was ticking with two minutes left and five moves to make. So I've got to think fast here. Now the first move I, you want to play, first move I looked at is queen takes pawn. But OK, I saw right away this is a very standard tactic. I can't do that because uh, black deflects the rook, protecting the queen. Rookie one check. These two squares are illegal for the king to go to. Knight covers it. Queen covers it. So white must play rook takes rook or resign. Black won't accept a draw offer. And now black's just going to swap rooks. Rook takes rook check. Rook takes rook. And white's queen is hanging on d4. And black has won a queen for a rook. Easy win for the black bits. OK, that one I saw pretty fast. The next thing I looked at was even easier to refute. But the next thing that ran through my head was just to play rook d2 just to try to get that rook out of my hair. But now, uh, now rookie won again. Check. And for white to continue to play the game in a second here, he's going to have to move his queen to f1 and get taken by black's rook. L losing. All right. OK. So this probably accounts for the first five seconds of my thinking on this position. And the next thing I thought about doing very modest. My pawn's attacked here. I thought about playing my pawn to a3. Not only did I think about it, my hand actually reached out, and I started to make the move. And as I started to make the move, I suddenly saw two very frightening things Black could do to me in this position. The first is to play rook takes pawn. Whoa, what's this? King takes rook. Queen check on h2. King f1. OK, it's not mate right away, because white's bishop on b7 covers this square. But I mean, you're in time trouble, right? Who the hell knows what's, oh, can I say hell on the internet? <laughs> you just did. Oh, <laughs> start the tape back. OK, this scared me. I had no idea about that. I didn't like the looks of that. And the other one. Might have even been scarier. A3, I realized black could play rook on 8 to E3. Oh, God. Right, if pawn takes rook, now the black queen comes down and delivers checkmate, check here, checkmate here. I was not, I, nothing, I had not been in any danger this game, even though I'd had no advantage. And this totally freaked me out. Suddenly, it seemed like I was facing a big attack. My clock is ticking. My flag is hanging. I, I think the best way to explain what happened next is that my hand reached out and played queen g3. And I hit the clock. And to my great surprise, I realized after I hit my clock that this move wins a piece. Why does it win a piece? So white's threatening black's queen. Queen takes queen. White's threatening black's knight. Queen takes knight. Black has no way to defend them both. All black can do, which black did, is to play queen takes queen check. And I recaptured with this pawn. Now the knight's trapped. A very unusual turn of events. So, so poor Mr. Y. Grecky was uh, not expecting this. And he had five minutes. And he used up all his time trying to find a way out of this. And he didn't. He played this. 
This is as good as he had in the position. I played pawn takes knight. He played rook takes pawn. We still have two moves to the time control. And it was, I can't tell you what an emotional relief it was when his flag fell as he played rook takes h3. Now, white is probably winning in this position. Black's going to get a couple pawns for the piece. This pawn will probably win the game for white. But the fact is, I was so nervous at this point, I did not know whether I was capable of making two more rational moves and making it to the time control. I was very happy when this game was over. All right. Lady Luck smiled on me in New Jersey. Oh, okay. Okay. What time do we start? We started a little late, didn't we? We've been filming for 37, 38 minutes. All right, this will just be a couple more hours. Okay, I can probably talk while I'm creating the opening position. Does Queen go on her own color? Is that right? Okay, so this next, uh, this next game was between me and now my computer interpreter, uh, Mr. Dave Gertler. This was the pivotal game in the 1982 U.S. Junior Open. Uh, I was 12 years old, Big Dave was 20, and this was an eight round event, and Dave was 6-0. and oh. He won his first six games, blew away the competition, including the highest rated player in the event. I had five points out of six, trailing him by one, one point. I had white, and I'll just show this to you from the beginning because the crucial combinational part of the game is pretty, uh, is pretty early. Okay, I'm going to go fast through these moves. Again, I'm white, knight f3, knight c6. So I played the Ponziani. I played a lot of garbage when I was 12, although Magnus Carlsen played this a couple times. Knight f6. D4, knight takes E4, D5, very well-known theory. Dave knew I was going to play the Ponziani. He plays knight B8. I think this is a good line. I think this is a smart line for black. Knight takes pawn, bishop C5. That's a good square. Queen comes out here, makes a double attack. Black can take on F2, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of risky. I thought black couldn't take on f2, but the computer says he can, so all right, fair enough. Queen takes e4. Okay, so black's sacrificed a piece, but it's very temporary. White's got this pinned situation on the e file. He could lose his queen to rook e8. Now, I, I just, I moved too quickly. I, I forgot what the line was. I moved too quickly. I played this move. That's a bad move. Dave plays queen e7. He wins back his piece, takes it, I castle. He develops rook e8. I played bishop f3, and I actually, I offered a draw here. I didn't like what I'd done with my position. I needed to win for the tournament, but after 12 moves is white, I offered a draw because I played so badly. Black is sort of playing the white pieces at this point. Black has better development. Nice bishop, control the e-file. It's going pretty well for black. Dave makes a courageous decision despite being 6-0 in the event. He declines with a bang. Plays b5, attacks my queen, and I, I did not play queen takes b5 because I've got this problem of this, this skewer, the bishop attacking my queen and getting my rook down here. Okay, I saw that much. So I move my queen back to b3. Now here's the $64,000 question of this game. Black, queen one. Is that a good move or a bad move? I'm not really asking you. You know, I'll answer this question in three seconds. <laughs> but I think from my opponent's point of view, he was 6-0 in the event. He had an obvious advantage as black after 12 moves. It can kind of make you feel a bit invincible. So he thought, 
is his manifest destiny here, and he's going he's gonna to crush me with this move. It's actually the losing move. This looks like it's a black to play and win position. It's actually white, white to play and win. Okay, queen e1. So now if rook takes queen, well, this is mate and one. All right, I saw that one. And black is now himself threatening mate in two with bishop takes f2 check on the f2 pawn. The king comes over to the corner. Queen takes rook. That's mate. Actually, black is a second mate in two threat. He, aside from bishop takes pawn check, black is also threatening queen takes pawn check. It's a little more obnoxious way to do it. Rook takes queen. Black plays rookie one. Now that's, uh, that ends the game, they say, checkmate. Okay, so clearly F2 has got to be defended by white. And um, how can white do it? Uh, maybe Dave thought I'd play my queen to C2 to defend. Okay, not that white's not gonna lose right away here, but black has now got this attractive move, attacking the white queen. Right, again, the, the white queen cannot take the bishop because we're back to the mate and two situation on f2. So white has to do something uh, ugly, clogging in his already undeveloped queen side, queen d2, black would retreat his queen. Uh, very nice for black. Game is not over, but very nice position for black. If I, if I, if I want to lose uh, pretty quickly here, I could play g3 and uh, allow bishop h3. This is, this, is, this is no fun for white. There's going to be a quiz on all this later. All right, now what I did play is a move that Dave saw. I played bishop e3, cutting off that bishop on the f2 square. And black's queen is actually trapped here, but Dave thought that I was losing a piece to rook takes bishop, which he played. And now the idea of this rook takes bishop, still if rook takes queen, rook takes rook as mate, that's unchanged. Pawn takes rook, allows bishop takes pawn, check. Now only legal move, king tucks in the corner, and queen takes rook as mate. And this is what Dave saw. Jadub. Uh, Mr. Gertler. My wonderful computer assistant later said that his problem was, where's my b-hopper? I took him away. Rook takes bishop. Dave later said that his problem was he was focusing on the center and on the king side, and he just did not think about this in-between move here that I played, knight a3. A rude awakening for black. So now black has taken a piece, but now white's connected his rooks. The threat of the queen is real. And black's only move to save his queen, which he played, is queen d2. And now I was simply able to, to chop off his rook with my pawn. Now again, I was, I was 12. I don't want to blame anything on being 12. I got a good game to show you later when I was 11. But I, I, I actually didn't see that I also had this move here, trapping black's queen. It's probably about equivalent to what move I played. Both moves win material. Pawn takes rook. And now to repeat something I said before, I'll, uh, I'll show you the uh, rest of the game just because it's so brief at this point. Uh, black goes down very quickly here. He checks. So he's got one pawn for the exchange, but he won't have it for long. Not only has white won the exchange here for a pawn, but white's completed his development and the process. And okay, white's knight is on a3, right? A knight on the rim is grim. A knight on the side I shall not abide. But this knight is now about to assume a very strong position on b5 because black just does not have time for this because of his back rank weakness, rook a1. Black resigns because the queen is attacked and rook e8 mate is there if the queen moves. So he cannot stop to protect his pawn. 
Instead, he has to defend his back rank, which he did with bishop d7. Now I win my pawn back. Now white's up, a rook for a minor piece. White still has to get developed. Threatening this pawn on c7, Dave goes knight a6. And now I played this. I think this is a good move, queen c4. Now I have the idea of maybe uncovering attack on this knight. And, and Black really should complete his development here if he's going to keep playing, and I would keep playing here. He should probably play rookie eight here, complete his development. Now, as a pretty greedy 12-year-old, I probably would have taken that pawn there, which wins a pawn. White's knight can be taken, but white has uncovered attack on Black's knight. Knight for knight is an even trade, but the pawn on a7 is in White's pocket. I, I don't know, though. Maybe, maybe it'd be even stronger for White after rookie eight to play b4. Bishop b6, a4. White has the initiative here, one way or the other. Not good for the black bits. Uh, Dave did not want to lose any more pawns. Jadub. So after my queen went to c4, he just retreated his queen to h6 right away. Now the white knight can't take any pawns in this position without without losing the knight. Knight takes pawn, queen takes knight, defending the knight on d6, and that sort of thing. But this accelerated black's demise, because after queen h6, I played a very simple move. Knight d4, now I'm threatening queen takes knight. If black had played bishop takes knight, which he did not do, I would recapture with a pawn for sure, renewing the threat if queen takes knight, which is not an easy piece to defend in this position. So instead, Dave made the undeveloping move, knight b8. My uh, hero, Mikhail Tall, used to say of these moves, the pieces are getting ready for the next game. <laughs> and now, now Dave packed it in. He resigned in this position. It's bad, very bad being exchanged down. When you're the, when you're the exchange down and you've got uh, undeveloped pieces, then that's trouble. Mm -hmm.